So as I said, we were, we're looking at the, we're going to be looking for the next three weeks um, the relationship with the Holy Spirit and us. And, uh, you know, and uh, it's about it. Today's subject is actually Holy Spirit and fire. And without a big introduction, point one is simply this. Where and who is he? Where and who is he? Talking about the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 3.11, it goes straight into, this is John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Very good. Now, if you paraphrase that, because I check out different translations, if you paraphrase that, it says, I, John the baptizer, am purposed to baptize you in repentance or unto repentance, the external demonstration of your internal decision to turn away from your sin, your sinful lifestyle, and surrender your life to the lordship and the blessed salvation forged by Christ, who is about to be revealed for all, for he alone is worthy to lead you into eternal life. And this Christ will baptize you with the one and only Holy Spirit with an anointing of fire. Amen. I like that. I like that. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 8 9 says, and this is way out of context, this is just one word out of a very heavy subject. If you read Romans, Romans takes a bit of working out. But anyway, this is the verse. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. They're the key words. The spirit of God dwells in you. And that's the only part I want you to know. The spirit of God dwells in you. So where is he on the earth right now? In you. So the spirit of God, his spirit is in you. Now, we hear that a lot, we read that a lot, we sing that a lot. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. So again, not only is God saying the Holy Spirit is in you, but I have now made you to be a temple, a place that is worthy to house the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of God. He's the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, part of the divine headship. He's co-equal. He's all-powerful. He's omnipresent. And he's a personality. He's a person. He's not a thing. And because he's a person, he has a soul. Like you and I. In fact, it's the other way around. We have a soul like him. Now, our soul, for those who need the intellect, is our mind, our will, emotions, our feelings, and our memories. My car does not have any of those things. Sometimes when we talk about our car, it's like it's a living thing, when it won't start. We tell it off, we swear at it, we do things, we even kick it, like it has a living soul, but it doesn't have a living soul. And these days, people do that with their computers and their iPhones. 
but they don't have a living soul. But the Holy Spirit does. Because he's a living personality. The Holy Spirit has a soul. Otherwise, if he didn't have a soul, he would not be able to comfort us because he's our comforter. He wouldn't be able to teach us because he's our teacher. He wouldn't be able to reveal truth to us because he knows what truth is. He wouldn't be able to reveal the sin in us if he didn't know how we operated and how we felt. He reveals to us who Jesus is and he reminds us of what Jesus has said and what Jesus has done. This Holy Spirit, this person, this part of God who lives in us. He's not an influence or a force or a thing. Star Wars did a bad thing by always calling the force. And we have a generation who thinks God's a force. He is a force to be reckoned with, but he's not a force. He's also not, he's also not fuel for our ministries. He's not something we tap into to do what we want to do. He's not a feeling. A lot of people rely on feelings. He's not a feeling. He's the Holy Spirit. And he's not a shadow or a ghost of Jesus. He's God. He is the Holy Spirit. He is alive. He's close. He is God. He's not our servant. He's our maker. That's who he is. One and only Holy Spirit of God. Matthew quoted from Isaiah about this Holy Spirit. He said, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. Now who is talking there is God. Isaiah is talking about what God is saying. Matthew is now using it to describe Jesus. But notice in there, I'm just going to say the word God for now. And Jesus, the servant, is well pleasing to his soul. In Matthew 26, 38, he said to them, my soul, this is Jesus speaking this time. Jesus said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. My soul is sorrowful. If we go to Hebrews 10, 38, it says, now you shall, now the just shall live by faith. And if anyone draws back, my soul has no, bloody has a soul. Your chair doesn't have a soul, and nor is your iPhone. But God has a soul. And the Holy Spirit has a soul. He also has a mind. Point two. You talk to me? Question I, you talk to me? If God is, no, is all-knowing and he teaches us all things, wouldn't it be good to know what his thoughts are towards us? Wouldn't it be a wise thing to know what you're saying to me? I think it would be. But it's a progression of thinking. Because he teaches us all things, he must know all things. There's nothing new to God. He doesn't wake up in the morning and go... So, what's the universe doing? Oh, look, that comet's about to hit that planet. Well, better have divert that. Oh, look, there's a new tree on the earth. No, nothing but nothing sees everything. So he saw everything from the beginning to the end. He saw it all in a flash. So he's not going to get tripped up by anything, confused by anything, wondered by anything. He doesn't go, go oh, I never knew that. His league is a league of a revelation from the planet. I never knew that. Well, that's interesting, Lee. He doesn't do that because he's God. 
He has all the information. He's all knowing. Now, Isaiah 55, 8 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the the Lord. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says this way. For I know the thoughts I have... mm, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. God speaking again. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a as I said it, and hope. But the truth is a lot of people aren't living in hope because they don't know the thoughts of God for their own lives. Actually, these circles are going to be interesting this week. He's not a force, he's a person. And anything you want to know, if you want to know what he thinks, ask. And that only happens in relationship. Actually, it doesn't come by reading a book, it comes in relationship. Point three. The will, of, the will of God dwells inside, on the inside. Oh, that was well said. The will of God dwells on the inside. You remember the story, it's the account. It's not a story, it's an account. Elijah destroys the prophets of Jezebel. All the prophets and priests she had under, destroys them. Jezebel challenges him. He runs for his life. He turned his nation around to follow God and then runs for his life as one woman speaks, but it's Jezebel. And she speaks, threatens his life, he's gone. Two days travel, he comes to a cave. In the cave, in the cave. But this is not a glamorous place to be when you've just been the forefront of your nation's repentance and now you're in a cave hiding. But anyway, that's where he is. God had just come along and shown him, this is the wind, this is the earthquake, and this is the fire. I'm not in any of those things. You know the story? Good. Verse 12, in 1 Kings 19, verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. He heard a still, small voice. Where was that voice? Inside him. This voice in Hebrew, the translation of that means a gentle silence, which beckons us to be in a place of wind and the fire. He had to block that out, calm himself down from the fear of Jezebel and being on the run. Calm all that down to a place of listening to this still, small voice. And what he does, he gets his mantle, wraps it around his head. So he shuts out the noise in the sight to listen to this voice. Because this voice was the Holy Spirit speaking to him. He's the prophet of the day. And when this this moment in time, everything turns around. Because now he's listening to the Holy Spirit. And now when he's listening, the Holy Spirit can now direct him. Because when he was on the clamour in his head and life, he could not hear. Now he hears. And now he, the Holy Spirit instructs him, okay, what are you doing here? Fisk, what are you doing here? Why he's here? I said, get up, go. Get the, get the, the warrior, warrior, anoint him as the king over Israel. Go to the next country, anoint that warrior as their next king. Now go and get Elijah, the man who's going to replace you, and anoint him to follow you, and he's going to be your apprentice, your understudy, your disciple, whatever you like to call it. They were the instructions. But he had to be still to hear those instructions. He had to be in a place with a still, small voice, He was listening to it. 
And then how? now he's got courage, direction, and God looked after him and got him to where he had to go. It's a big difference from running for your life from one woman to now, this is me. I've got to anoint two kings in two different countries and, and bring up, raise up the next prophet of this nation. That was his call. He was in a cave. How many of us are in our cave? When we should be out there doing this, this, or this. How many of us are still stuck in our cave? The same sort of story appears again in, oh, no, another story appears in, in Acts. If we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in us, he changes everything. He doesn't just change that you're listening. He actually restores your heart back to where it should be. And he restores your direction to where it should, you should be going. And he aligns your passions and your giftings with your destiny. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But you've got to listen. I'm not saying you don't listen. I'm not saying that I'm the one who listens. Because if you only knew. We think we listen. But anyway, Paul in Acts 16.6 thought he was going to Asia, ready to go. Him and Timothy, actually. And there was an entourage, there was a group of them, or whoever else was in that party. I don't know who else was in that party. Anyway, so now they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatania. And they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach a word in Asia. Forbidden to preach a word in Asia. Who forbid them? Who forbade them? Holy Spirit. Why? We don't know. It's fine. Because it wasn't his will. Because the Holy Spirit has a will for us. See, we don't go to him and say, I want to do this. This is my shopping list, God. Here's my one thing. And on the back I have got yeah, this month I want a new car. This is not men's, our men's group is what we do and we get it, but anyway. We want a new car and I feel like going on a missions trip to India and I want you to pay for it all and mm, I could do with a wife and mm, what can you do about that, God? That's not how God works. That's how some of us think he works, but he doesn't work like that. He works in a way that he prepares us for what he wants us to take us to. And whether, whether we let him do it or not, he still seems to prepare us. And I always have this saying that says, you have a choice. You can either do this, I want you to study this, I want you to get this credential, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and I want you to do this. And then when, you're, when I feel you're ready, I'm going to launch you into it. But, you know, most of us are still a bit slack in that area. So... The other way is the hard way. The plane you're on is now crashing into India. Here's your parachute. When you get down, you're going to be my servant. Like, God just pushes us into a place and all of a sudden we've got to do something about our situation. And it usually means the first thing is, God help me. God help me. I'm out of my depth. I don't know what I'm doing. I had a a major fear in my life. I was bullied a lot as a kid. We, I, I live, come from a little country town. And there was this, um, we called them the big boys. You know, it was school terms, you know. Yes. Oh, the big boys, the bullies, that sort of stuff. Anyway, in our school they were. And, and I can name them to this day. And I'm 65 years old, I can name their names. Because they made such an imprint in my heart. Because they made my life hell. And two of them were so bad, not just to me, any living creature in actual fact. One of them blew up the neighbor's cat. Now listen to those words, blew up the neighbor's cat. Made a bomb and blew him up. 
Now, while we were all at school in the 1960s, color TV wasn't around. The Beatles were playing, all you need is love. <laughs> These kids were making bombs. One of them blew up another kid, blew his hand off, blew all his teeth out of his mouth. I went to school with these kids. And it wasn't, when I, it wasn't at all, and I had a real fear of people. I had a real fear of being bullied. Because I know how intimidating that is. Even in class, you'd be standing in class, and for some of my mind, because I didn't want to do anything with but the big boys are in my class. I'm three, two years younger than them, and they're in my class. We're in a country school, multiple grades per class. So I tell one of the, Lawrence is his name. Lawrence is doing whatever he's not supposed to be doing, and my job was to tell him not to be doing that. So I stand right in front of him. You need to sit down. He gets his hand under my chin. He gets the other hand at the back of my head. And I'll just be straight off the ground. My feet. I couldn't exert a lot of authority up there. That's what it was like. When, I be when we became Christians, I had a, a bit of a colourful background. We won't go into that today. But one of the things was that we had had over our place at one stage the leader of Black Power gang in our house. And as time ticked on, he stole our car. It's like being bullied again, isn't it? Anyway. And so then he... he and the police knew about it before I knew about it. So the policeman, which I actually knew, and he knew me my name which is a bit unfortunate. Chris, yes, you know where your car is? No, I'll tell you where it is. It's down in such and such a tavern. Oh, okay. Do you want to come with me? No, I don't want to be seen in the cop, cop car. Anyway, he said, well, you're coming with me anyway. Okay, we're going together, all right. Can I sit in the front? I don't want to sit in the back, look like I'm a crim. No, you can sit in the front, all right, that's fine. So we're driving and we come to the place and as I see my car going down the highway, and he says, is that your car? Yeah, it's my car. Did you see who was driving? I knew who was driving. No, sort of. It was so-and-so, wasn't it? Yes, it was so-and-so. Right, that's all I need from you. Okay, I'll drop you off home. Bye. Three days later, I get a summons. He actually knocks on my door. Tony, the nice policeman who I was doing wiring jobs for, knocks on my door and gives me a summons. I thought you were my friend. I've got to go to court, which you didn't authorise for him to have. One, he's not allowed to drive until he stole it. He was going back inside for that. I didn't care if he was going to hell. I just thought, my life is over. And so for the next week, I was shaking. Because I know what the bullies do. But these bullies have guns and knives. So I went to God. I'm a new Christian. Brand new. And I go to God, trembling. Help me. I don't know what to do. Make it go away. First thing, make it go away. Didn't go away. Tony, my friendly cop, came back to see me again. So how are you going? Is it, is it over? Like, can we just forget about it now? Is there another way? Can I just write a letter? No, no and no. Okay. The day of the court case, I dress up. I don't know how to dress up. I go to the court. I'm still shaking, but I've talked to God about it a few times, and I did have a piece of sorts. You know how you've got a sort of a piece, but not a total piece? Your mind's thinking of 10,000 10, 10, things, but your heart's okay. But you don't want to talk about it because you might cry. It's that sort of delicate spot you get in. So I'm in that delicate spot. Don't talk to me about anything. Don't ask me how I am. My boss says, why, why do you need to die off for? Oh, don't ask me that. So I rock up at the courthouse. And because Black Power have motorbikes, Harleys, they also have big old American cars. 
And of course, there they all are. Oh, there's a few here. So, I'd only just given up smoking, so I thought, oh man, this is a bad week. That courthouse steps. And Tony, the friendly cop, comes out. Chris, you're here. I think I didn't have a choice, did I? Next step. He says, it's okay. When he heard you were testifying, he pleaded guilty. So I didn't have to show my face to all the black power in that courthouse. Because all he would have done is just pointed to me. That's all he would have had to do. And they would all know who I am and what was going to happen to me. So he had to go back to prison. I've never, ever seen him again. Thank God for that. <laughs> but the thing is, some of the things of the past still echo in our lives. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to start to address them, then he puts you in a situation where you've got to face them. And that's the cry for help. Because when you put yourself in a place where he can address it, I'm your, I'm your supporter, I'm your comforter, I will, take, I will do this. All the nice things God does is a good place. But when we don't listen and we don't give them the time, we don't make the time to sit with them and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. We don't still ourselves long enough to allow him to speak. Or we don't still ourselves long enough to hear him. He'll get a point across eventually. You won't like it. I didn't like it. So I always tell people, there's an easy way and a hard way. Please choose the easy way. But I know most of you are going to choose the hard way. Because that's who we are. But when we choose the hard way, God is still gracious, still gets us through. It's just our blood pressure and our hearts don't handle it very well, but we get through. Paul wasn't allowed to go into that country to preach because the Holy Spirit forbade him. You're not going. He actually went later. You need to go to Macedonia. They're crying out for you. Go there. You're not going into Asia. Okay. There's two ways to know God's will. Simple ways. This is not the whole complete story of anything. I've done a fair bit of listening to different sermons and reading about this sort of stuff lately. This is not all my stuff, just so you know. If you want to generally know about finances, you read the word. I think John talked about tithing this morning. Okay, Malachi 3.10. We go to Malachi 3.10. We learn about that. We learn about giving, so we go to this part of the Bible. We learn about the rewards of giving, so we go to this part of the New Testament. We learn about God as the supplier, so we go back to the Old Testament. We look at the Word, and the Word tells us what we need to know about finances. True. Because all that's His will. But when you want it requires something else. That requires a conversation now with the Holy Spirit. What do you say? What do you say about this? Do I give anything into missions this week, Lord? If so, how much? I already know from the word that you like people giving into missions. Because, my, because if you do, then my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory which are in Christ Jesus. And you read that in context. That's what it means. So, in a general sense, we get to know God's will about something. But specifically, we've got to have the conversation. Word and the Spirit work together. They do not work independently. You can't base your life just on the Word because I, all sorts of people come up to me and say, well, this is what the Word says. Yeah, but what's the Holy Spirit saying? Oh, oh I feel, this is the people who are the super spiritual, I feel that God is telling me this. Yeah, but the Word doesn't say that. Oh, I had one lady told me that she's going to be the mother of Jesus when he returns. The word doesn't say that. <laughs> oh. So the Holy Spirit and the work work together. And this is the basis of what we've been talking about for a year and a half now, meditating on the word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak and allowing God's word to direct us. That's the basis of that. We are in a privileged place. If you look at the Old Testament, people did not have this place that we have that the Holy Spirit is in us. They would have a prophet who would hear from God 
that would be it. Or you might get a king, or you might get a priest that were here from God. Eli, David. And then Nate, Samuel, not Samuel. Samuel, yes, Samuel. Samuel was there for a number of kings. He was the only voice for many years. For decades, in actual fact. Then you may not have anybody speak. Sometimes judges hear from God. And then you won't have anybody speak for decades. In one case, centuries. The voice of God was not common. Today, the voice of God is common because the Holy Spirit dwells where? In us. So we, sometimes we behave like we live in the Old Testament. I need a word from the prophet. I need a word from this. I need this. I need that. That's the Old Testament thinking. Now, we do have prophets who give us words and leaders who give us, word, give us words. But that's not what you base your life on. They are confirming what the Holy Spirit has already said. And the thing was, when I was a, not so, in between uh, a new Christian and old Christian, in between, I used to like getting words from God. I used to get a lot of words from God from people. I used to love it. But then I got really offended when I went to a meeting and I didn't get a word. I got offended that God did not give me a word. How arrogant. I got offended that the God of the universe chose not to speak through anybody to me. I took offence. I'm not going back to, I don't like that prophet. Because God decided, I'm not speaking to you through this man today. So who are you really offended with? The pastor or the preacher, the prophet who didn't speak, or God who didn't deliver a word for you? See, we get offended by the stupidest things. Because God may be at right at that moment saying, you don't need to hear from anyone else, you just need to hear from me. I've got something to say to you and I'm saying it and you need to hear from me. The word that I had at the beginning of the meeting for someone was this. You pursue knowledge and that's good. But I want you to pursue my wisdom because that will equip you. You pursue knowledge and that is good but I want you to pursue my wisdom in every area of your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So in the book of Job, when he said, Job 2.28, he said, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall have dreams. No longer needing other people to tell us because he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, all of us. Sometimes we've got to think, that means me. That means me. And that means we have to learn or sit with God to hear him one on one. We don't always need that third person. So we need to seek God. In Acts, 2, in Acts 2, 3 and 4, it says, this is when the day of Pentecost. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire as each, and sat on each of them. It said, we, Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues. And God spoke to me about this on the way up. He said, we as leaders, we coerce people and on their back, we speak in tongues, we encourage, we do all these things. You know, who's been there? These guys didn't have that because there was no one to teach them. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that it just poured out of them. Amen. It bubbled up. It just flowed. See, our emphasis is wrong. We keep needing another person to help us. No, the Holy Spirit is quite capable. Quite capable. God is quite capable. There's an interesting story, which is a bit of a warning. It's in Acts 8 and 9. Now, there was a certain man, I'm reading this out, it won't come up on the screen. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery, magic, in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming he was someone great. 
to whom they gave great heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a great power of God or has the great power of God. And they heeded him because they were astonished. He astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when, the, when they believed, when the people of the area believed that Peter, uh, Philip, preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And Simon himself believed and was baptized and continued with Philip and was amazed at seeing the miracles and the signs that were done. Do you get the story? So this sorcerer gets converted and he's following them. But he's amazed at what they're doing. Now, when the apostles, because the apostles are actually still in Jerusalem, so when the apostles heard that the people of Samaria had, heard, had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. So they had received Christ, they were being baptized, but they had not received the Holy Spirit yet. So Peter and John went down there to help with that. For yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them, and they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. He offered them money. I want to buy this way of doing this. No, 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 no. There's no shortcuts in God. There's no shortcuts. He does it. But Simon wanted to do it his way. I want what they've got, but I want to do it my way. The Holy Spirit. There are no shortcuts, comes, shortcuts and there are no wrong motives. Verse 19 says, Give me the power also, so whoever I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased by money. You have neither part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness, and pray to God, and perhaps the thought of your heart will be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned with bitterness and bound in iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken will come upon me. Witchcraft, New Age, want the power of God, but they don't want God. Amen. Things sound right, people say the right things, it looks like the right stuff, even say the right prayers, then go through the right door. This is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, or use the power of God to do your own thing. You're in the wrong place. And you will perish with that. And it's a confusing age we're in because a lot of people are doing their own thing under the name of Jesus. Or thinking it's the power of the Holy Spirit. But it just isn't. I was going to talk about grieving the Holy Spirit, but we're not going to have time for that. But the Holy Spirit's a person. His personality. He lives in us. Give him time. Give him time. Don't give him your agenda. Give him time. Give him your heart. Give him the space. Make a place for him. Honour him with your heart, not just your lips. I'm going to end with that. Lee, can you just play? I'm going to close the meeting in a second, but Lee, can you just play? Sometimes we have to just take account of the things that plague us or how we treat God. Is there a hindrance in my heart? Is there something stopping me receiving everything that God wants from me? Is there something in my nature that stops me? Is there something in my behavior that stops me? Is there just something in my thinking? 
I should be in the balloon in my ministry. But I'm still scratching around down here. I'm not hearing God how I should be hearing God. I'm still full of fear. There are reasons for these things. Sometimes it requires repentance. Sometimes it requires help. God, help me. Sometimes it simply is, I didn't know. Let's spend some moments with God by yourself, with nobody praying for you. Feel free. Only God knows your heart and what's happening in your heart right now. I don't. So you're not obeying or disobeying me. If you want prayer in any area of this, then come up the front and just let me know or let us know, doesn't have to be me, that you want prayer. Again, only the Holy Spirit knows this. I don't know who those people are. Please don't bring me up when I get home and then ask me then. I will not be pleased. So Father God, right now we come before you we give you our hearts, our time. Holy Spirit, I ask you to make yourself real to each one of us. Show us why we can't move forward. Show us what we're hanging on to. Show us. I want to give my heart to you in every area of my life. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God.